What's up, guys? Welcome back to the Live Loud Life Podcast. Uh, today, we're doing another awesome episode outside. Why? Because it's pretty nice out right now, and we can be outside. Um, currently, I'm looking at grayish skies, which makes it a little bit cooler than it's been in Colorado. Although right now, um, uh, and fortunately for Colorado, we're not having a lot of the fires, but we're getting a lot of smoke from the West Coast. So uh, prayers and thoughts with those guys all out there, because as we know in Colorado, the fires suck, and when you're dealing with all that... It's no fun, but it's nice being outside, getting some fresh air, um, you know, getting some sunlight and all that beautiful stuff that comes with being outside. So um, no housekeeping today. Uh, we're just going to dive right into it. Today, what we're going to be talking about is core exercises for low back pain. Now, this is a very, very common question uh, and topic, if you will. And something that I think gets just thrown around without a lot of thought or context. And that's really what we wanted to first start off with is context, right? Any sort of blanket, quote unquote, statement is not going to be very beneficial. And we know that. that. I mean, that makes sense in general, right? But what we get so commonly is when someone comes in with lower back pain and whether this would be um, you know their second or third time of having a bout or they're 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 looking for additional help from uh, from a provider because they haven't been getting any results or seeing progress we ask them well what did the, you know what did the previous practitioner do what kind of assessment what kind of evaluation what did they think was going on what kind of recommendations for um the what was the treatment plan protocol what you know the home home exercises so on and so forth right and and the reason why this gets us so excited is because w providing context provides so much valuable information and sometimes it's not even the information that was wrong it's just that the context was not right and so it didn't really mesh with where the patient or the client was at and it just didn't make sense to them right so sometimes just reframing the context of maybe where that practitioner was and the right answer that they might have given had so much more value that then all the kind of pieces click together and they're like, ah, oh, all right, now I know what we're doing and now I know where we're going. So many times, many times we don't even change what was being done, but provide, but by providing the better, a, a, a clearer frame of reference and context, we have a better plan. And then we, and then we implement that better plan and modulate and change as seen fit. Right. But, but getting, so first and foremost context, right? So for instance, right, core exercises. Core exercises, core core exercises as a general is that's a very extensive list, right? Crunches and um, and boat pose and technically kipping and different things like that would all be technically categorized and classified under what we would call core exercises, right? Because it's working the core. Now, to say that core exercises as a deficit or weakness is is not a very good uh, indicator or diagnosis of why low back pain started. Um, but not saying that, again, is not true because what we have to do is consider the context. The context around, well, if you're someone who is, you know, lifting fairly heavy weight or doing, you know, fairly challenging movements and your core is not up to par for the demands that you're giving it, then yes core weakness for what you're doing might be part of the reason why that you're having experienced low back pain or why the low back is taking on more load, so on and so forth, right? But what happens is we just like your core is weak. So then you get core exercises and you're doing the core exercises over and over again, expecting the low back pain to either go away or for your core to get really strong, now, just like anything else, the core exercises have to be progressive. The progressive overloading or the progressive challenging of the movements is what then makes you stronger. To simply just do core exercises will not necessarily get you stronger. Now, what you also see, though, is a neural adaptation um, 
phenomenon, not even a phenomenon, just neural adaptation, uh, I guess for the listeners, I might see more as a phenomenon for, for clinicians is very well researched and, 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 and proven is that oftentimes what we're doing is we're not maybe getting muscle hypertrophy, but we're improving neural efficiency, oftentimes first and foremost, and thus, oh, you hear that? We've got a little rumble thunder in the back. Nice. We need the rain. Um, uh, and so the neural efficiency is actually what will commonly uh, start improving first and foremost, which is great because we get a lot of the response that we're looking for immediately. And then we want the hypertrophy to obviously uh, come there afterwards because the hypertrophy is the more muscle hypertrophy you have, the longer you'll be able to maintain or have that uh, muscle strength that you that, that you're ultimately looking for and trying to gain. So that's part of the process as well, which is all very important, right? But, you know, kind of coming back to the topic at hand is core exercises for low back pain. Now, again, it would have to be first and foremost, determine what type of back pain, what are your directional preferences. So for instance, the majority of the population that I at least see and work with are flexion intolerant. And the reason why is most of us are either doing too much inflection or doing dumb things in flexion, or we're not strong enough in flexion. Um, we're picking up things poorly in flexion. And, and then that movement becomes sensitized or intolerant because it does not feel good anymore. So that is, that is, that is important because that's that helps us determine what things we should and should not be doing or temporarily avoiding and modifying. That's really, I mean, when it comes down to a lot of um, pain modulation and, and recovering from injury, so on and so forth, it's doing less of the things that irritate the tissue and irritate your body and sensitize the area and doing a lot more of the things that actually feel good that you want to be able to do and should be able to do kind of in a nutshell, right? So when we determine that, we also then look at the deficits or weaknesses based on, you know, maybe some maybe some isometric holding test, uh, so on and so forth. But we kind of start from the bottom. So again, to make this as concise and beneficial for you as a listener and for those others, we are going to take the flexion intolerant low back pain. Why? Because it is the most common, at least from what I've seen and for the questions that we get asked. Now, are there other types of low back pain? 100%. There's extension intolerant, which would be, you know, you don't like hyperextending or lifting your back and a number of different things. And with that, obviously, components of rotation, lateral flexion, so on and so forth. We're just trying to like we're trying to box you in somewhat to make this as applicable as possible, right? So for the flexion intolerant low back pain, we are going to, you know, again, to context, to, to, con to, to provide a little bit more context around this, let's say it's an individual who is having low back pain because they had a poor deadlift or um, poor squat where there is maybe excessive butt winking or something that now it hurts to put on your socks. It hurts to put on your pants. It hurts to sit for too long. So on and so forth. Does it sound? Does it sound familiar? Does it sound like someone you may know who's experiencing this, or something that you've been through yourself? Very commonly, you get that kind of like stiff, locked back, or you've been sitting for too long. You've been in the car and you get out, and you're kind of like that. Oh, it takes a second to kind of like get yourself back up, right? That's what we're talking about. Now, first and foremost, it's pain management, right? Because there's not a lot that we can do with core exercises if everything is hurting, any movements, any movements hurting, so on and so forth. So. There's a number of different podcast episodes we have, blog posts, videos throughout our websites that talk about the um, the immediacy of certain exercises that are beneficial for you to start doing. Okay, now with that though, we then want to start getting um, quote unquote the core back online. So part of what we're doing, like we said earlier, was that neur uh, that neuromuscular adaptation is that the nervous system starts to improve kind of uh, first and foremost. So what your body's really good at doing is making sure that it doesn't hurt more, right? So part of the reason why your back locks up on you or seizes, if you will, is it's protective. The muscles are super strong. You get enough muscles to spasm and contract, you're locking it down. And when you lock it down, you can't move much. And when you can't move much, you're more than likely not going to be able to load the tissues that that were either damaged or feel vulnerable, whatever your body is um, feeling or indicating, right? That's super helpful. That's very, very helpful and a good thing. Now, 
that can add to your pain. If you've ever had a back spasm and, or any spasm or a cramp, those muscles just contracting for an extended period of time does not feel too hot. It does not feel too good. So yes, that is where massage and dry needling and acupuncture and chiropractic and other manual therapies help with lower back pain, but understanding the underlying mechanism of why that happened is important. Once we get that suppressed, now we start to get things back online because what your body also does is in addition to that spasm or locked up mechanism we just talked about, it then will start to suppress the, the output, the firing component, activation, what other buzzwords can we throw out here, right, of the nearby muscles, very commonly your hip structure, your glutes, so on and so forth, so that your body slows down. Right. So you're, you know, a lot of people be like, oh, my glutes aren't firing or this is latent or whatever that is. We know that pain suppresses that motor output signal to the muscles. And very commonly, that's going to include obviously the core, right? Your core is a set of muscles surrounding. Now, let's take a sidebar real quick and just have a very, very brief conversation about what the core actually is. So what I want you to imagine is your the structure or your, your rib cage, right? We know the ribs um, surround our chest, but what most of us forget is the ribs actually go all the way around through the back, right? The actual attachment point is on the spine, and then they wrap around to the front and attach onto the sternum. They protect, obviously, a lot of the vulnerable structures, such as our lungs, our heart, so on and so forth. Now, the way that we breathe is through the diaphragm. The diaphragm, which is kind of like an umbrella. So if you're watching the video, you think of like an umbrella that's uh, been opened up. Now, if that umbrella can invert from a, um, I guess, a con, uh, a concave position kind of, or, or uh, umbrella shape kind of coming up, and then it, it drops down and goes the complete opposite direction so that it's more of like a bowl structure, that not even a bowl, it more so flattens out, I should say. We're just trying to create the visual here. So think of an umbrella that then can flatten out. So we have an umbrella, and then that flattens out. That's the way that the diaphragm operates. As that as it does that, it creates a, a kind of a, a, a negative pressure system or a vacuum system in which air then comes into our lungs, right? Now we can, what's nice about the, the, the way that we breathe is we can actually intentionally alter and change that. We can speed up our respiration or slow down our respiration with accessory muscles that also help. That's the inside point. Underneath, we have the pelvis, right? And at the bottom of our pelvis is our pelvic floor. Both males and females have a pelvic floor. Um, consider that. That is uh, obviously shaped more like a bowl because of our pelvic outlet, right? So we have the umbrella shape on the top and then the bowl on the bottom. Now, if you imagine that as the top or the bottom of like a canister or a can, we need to then make the walls. The walls would be what we would assume the rest of the core would be. So we have our rectus abdominis, which would be like your six pack muscles, the internal, external obliques. Um, we have transverse abdominis. And then we also have, you know, someone argue that the QL, multifidus, and some of the paraspinals would also be part of that because that is what makes up a lot of the backside. Now, the backside has the, the spine which is a little bit more structured than the front side, which is just a soft abdominal wall. But that is essentially what we're referring to as the core. Now, what is important about the core is how it operates. The operational um, uh, mechanism at best, if you will, for the core is a force transmitter. Right now, it can create force obviously in and of itself, but it's very good at translating the force. And, and the best kind of visual as I think of is like, if you're thinking about a swinging type of sport, whether that would be a uh, rotational, whether that would be punching or swinging a baseball bat or swinging a tennis racket, you plant your feet on the ground, you pivot around your hips and all of that force that you generate from pushing off the ground is then translated through or transferred through the abdominal abdominal wall of the core up into your upper extremity where you're either hitting, punching, throwing, or uh, swinging uh, a, a racket or some, a bat of some sort, right? So it's really good at translating or transferring that force. Now, in doing so, it does that better with less movement throughout the the spine, right? Now there is movement. It's not completely rigid. We do need a little bit of movement. So consider a bow and arrow. 
a very stiff bow and arrow, you're not going to be able to get a lot of movement out of it, especially, or sorry, I should say this, a bow and arrow that cannot move or flex at all, you're not going to get any force or power out of, right? It's stiff, it's dead. If it's too loose, all that force that you're generating gets lost because there's too much movement going throughout trying to transmit the force. That sweet spot's kind of right in the middle. It can create enough tension, but also let, let enough tension pass and go through. Okay. Now when we're training the core, we have to take some of that into consideration, but that's a little bit down the spectrum. But if you know where you're going, then you know where you can start. So for instance, when we're dealing with backtracking to that specific uh, type of back pain that we're talking about, and my guess is if you're listening to this, you've experienced that, you're experiencing it right now, so on and so forth, and it's important that we need to address that. So what we need to do is get those core muscles back online, because right now they're a little late and they're a little delayed, they're, they're kind of soft and just not doing what they should be able to do because they're preventing you from doing more damage or harm or pain to the lower back. Again, not indicating that anything is damaged. It could just simply be uh, intolerant or sensitized tissue that have no damage whatsoever, which is, again, very important to understand and realize if you're having lower back pain. So with that being said, right? Now what we need to do is get it back online. So we start with some basic sparing um, kind of bracing type of exercises that help you understand what tension is, where you need tension, when you need to let go of tension, so on and so forth. So now rather than our body doing the subconscious spasm activation, tighten thing up, we can actively do that. So we give the body or the back more specifically the tension that it is needing and craving, especially when you're flexing forward or doing something or picking something up so that it doesn't feel vulnerable and it doesn't go into spasm and freak out mode. So if you can intentionally do that, you kind of override that oh crap system and that helps you fend off potential times when you may or may not have pain. Super important. It's very valuable, right? The less you're in pain, the less you'll be in pain. So right there, that that there is enough for you to want to consider even doing this because it helps out so much throughout the day with all the things that you're doing. So we work on this bracing strategy. Now, the best way to start to do this is with just your breath. So Oftentimes, we'll implement this belt. It's called the Core 360 belt, which we basically put around your waist. Now, understanding that your waist is essentially that kind of line that surrounds your abdominal wall around your back, roughly around where your belly button is. That is the space that's also between, like on your back, it's the space between your ribs and your pelvis. That is the best way for us to start to work on this activation type of principle. So part of what we need to do is just reestablish the breath pattern that helps us utilize this pressure system. Now, remember that canister that we talked about. That canister can be pressurized through our breath. So if we have the abdominal wall surrounding, the pelvic floor on the bottom, the diaphragm on top, as that diaphragm drops down, you're technically decreasing the volume of that cavity. And as you decrease the volume, the pressure goes up. Now, this is handy because as we just mentioned, being able to pressurize help stabilize. And if you can stabilize, you feel less vulnerable. The less vulnerable you are, the less pain, the less spasm, the less um, locked up, hopefully we can make you feel. Now that also makes you a little bit more efficient too, as we're reestablishing these movement patterns. So we start with the breath. Now, if you're having trouble breathing into that canister and understanding what an actual quote unquote diaphragmatic breath might be, this core 360 belt is super handy for you to be able to do that. Now the core 360 is also good because because now it gives you a little bit of feedback as far as manually increasing that bracing pattern. So we've already talked about increasing the bracing pattern through just your breath alone, right? Valuable. Decrease surface or decrease the volume, increase the pressure, increase that bracing component. Now what we can do is actually stiffen our abdominal wall to make that bracing pattern um, more, uh, again, even more so of a conscious control type of a movement. So what this looks like and what this means is, uh, you know, as an example is think about if someone was, if Bruce Lee, if someone was going to come hit you in the abdominal wall or kick you, what would you do? How would you protect your abdomen, your insides, whatever that is? You'd stiffen. You try to make your abdominal wall hard, 
right? You want, you don't want a soft belly because that's only going to, uh, you know, get you crushed. So you actually want to stiffen. It's that kind of uh, type of sound. So one way you can practice doing this is if you take a sniff of air and you um, make a kind of forceful exhale. So whether you want to imagine blowing out a candle, you know, maybe six to eight feet away, where you kind of go that kind of quick exhale push, you should feel your abdominal wall stiffen or brace a little bit, right? So do it, do it one more time with me. So you're going to put your fingers kind of right where your obliques would be. You know, if you go to your belly button and maybe go out like four inches and just kind of hold your fingers there, just go, you should feel that little pulse. Now that's only if you need to understand what the feeling is. Now what you now what we want to be able to do is actually create that kind of it's not distension. We're not pushing out. It you actually it actually feels like it's coming out just because the muscles contract and they expand a little bit, right? But now what we can do is if you can generate that stiffening principle, you can now override and create a very conscious effort as far as bracing, which is activating, using those buzzwords, activating the entire core system to stiffen and brace to help protect and make your back feel less vulnerable. This is powerful because it gives you a lot of control and autonomy around your pain, especially when you have certain activities of daily living, such as bending over to change your kiddo or unloading the dishwasher or picking up toys or whatever that is for you. If it's super vulnerable, we teach hinging and then a little bit of bracing to help stabilize so that you don't feel so vulnerable. It creates a little bit more power, control, and strength, okay? Now, expanding upon that, we want to add movement, right? Because obviously life is a little bit more complex than just sitting around and not doing anything or just bracing patterns. We need to add a little bit of movement. So we start with... um, we start with a couple basic expanded uh, movements that help take that bracing pattern to another level, right? So baseline of what we're looking at is called the McGill Big Three. Now, uh, the McGill Big Three is super... Well... I'll, I'll take that back. There's the, I, I, I spoke, at, spoke, spoke a little bit ahead of myself. So a lot of what we refer to pulls from the McGill big three, I've altered it slightly just based on, uh, kind of the complexity of the curl up. And I, and I default to a dead bug exercise in my mind. I think it is a better entry level, um, for majority of people that at least I work with that have lower back pain, but it's not something that we throw out completely because we do revert back to it. So we're talking about bird dogs, side planks, and dead bugs first and foremost. So what we're essentially trying to do is take that stiffening principle and do movements that teach you how to maintain the torso rigidity or stiffness that helps prevent some of the vulnerability and pain that you're experiencing and create a little bit more power control so that you can move more, move more efficiently because the more you move, the better you feel, the better you feel, the less pain you'll be and so on and so forth, right? You get where we're going with this. Uh, You know, very, very kind of simply laid out pathway, but a little bit more difficult, obviously, when you're in the pain. So let's start with the dead bug because we've been doing a lot of the breathing exercises on our back to begin with, either with or without the core 360 belt so you can feel that tension. Now, the dead bug, what's nice, and especially if you have the core 360 belt on is you have that biofeedback of being able to make sure that you expand and brace the entire torso. You're not just doing a belly breath so you that your belly is expanding. You should actually feel your lower back kind of uh, grow as well, right? That creates that nice, that nice stiff bracing system in a 360 degree manner. Now, what we do is our, the dead bug, for those of you who are unaware, is you're laying on your back, you're doing that breathing pattern, your arms are straight towards the ceiling, so realistically, that's out in front of your chest because you're on your back. Your knees are stacked over your hips, and then your ankles are in line with your knees, so it kind of creates like this, and your toes are up, so it creates a 90-90-90 position. Your ankles, your ankles at 90 position, your knees are at 90 degrees, and then your hips are at 90 degrees. So we start with just first and foremost, now in this slightly activated position because you're holding your knees up and you start breathing, right? We're doing the same breath exercise we do. Now we're breathing behind the shield is what they call it, right? So because our torso is a little bit more activated because we're holding our arms and our knees up, 
Now we're going to breathe into the shield and making sure that we can maintain that position without losing it when we breathe. So commonly what happens is when someone's in this position who maybe has a little bit of this dysfunctional breathing pattern or dysfunctional core control pattern is when they get into that holding position, they can do it if they hold their breath, but the moment they take a breath in, they lose it. Their ribs flare or their low back kind of buckles. And sometimes I might even have pain when that happens, right? So now we know this is an area that we need to work with. We are not yet able to maintain the tension or control that we have outside of breathing. If you don't control the movement with breathing. You don't own the movement as Greg Cook says, right? So we need to be able to breathe within a movement to be able to control it. So we start with that. And as you start to get better and better, you get more efficient. And honestly, a lot of times it's just a motor learning process and you actually catch on fairly quickly. Depending, there's no big strength deficit, so on and so forth. We're going to start moving some of our limbs. So now we're going to take one arm, and we're going to reach it up overhead towards the ground. So we're taking a mass and we're moving it away from midline, increasing the lever arm of the weight away from midline, making it more challenging for your midline slash your core, I should have used said core, to be able to maintain the position that it has been holding already. So this is a vital component to start adding movement to making sure that your torso as that force transfer, force transducer type of uh, uh, mechanism can maintain its position while you move arms appendages around it. So we start with one limb at a time, arm, 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 back and forth so you get it. And then the heavier legs, we're simply just bending at the hip. So we keep the 90 degree angle at the hip and the knee. So your arm, your leg's not going long. Like if you're doing like a leg lower, you're simply just dropping your heel straight down uh, and only moving about the hip. Obviously, that's going to be a lot more challenging than the arm. So again, you want to make sure that you have the integrity, so on and so forth. And then what we do is we add the opposite arm, opposite leg. So that kind of classic, cro- uh, that classic, excuse me, cross crawl pattern or position where we're moving left arm and right leg at the same time and then right arm and then left leg at the same time. Now we expand upon that. Once you kind of get that, we practice, we practice, we practice. We add the breathing, we control the breathing, so on and so forth. We add tempo, we add reps, we go slower, faster, um, so on and so forth, right? You can increase the lever arm ever so slightly by trying to extend the knee as you go down. You get the point, right? But we build upon that, right? Now the other ones which is going to be the side plank. We actually do, actually, I'm I'm going to back up and do the bird dog first. So the bird dog is no different than the dead butt. The bird dog is on your hands and knees. So it's a very similar 90-90 position for the hips, the knees, uh, and the ankles. Hands are out in front of us just like we were. Essentially, just imagine your dead bug where you're on your back. You just flip yourself all the way over so you're on your hands and knees. We've all seen the dead bug done before, but what we've also seen the dead bug is just sloppy dead bugs, right? We've heard, or sorry, uh, bird dogs. We, we're task and goal driven. So when someone says reach your arm forward and your foot backwards without a lot of context or frame of reference of what you should or should not be doing, you just do whatever, right? You complete the task at hands and oftentimes we just get a lot of hyperextension and rib flaring without a lot of control. That whole breathing thing we just talked about, you have to apply it here. So what we're doing, and that's why the core 360 belt is oftentimes very handy, is you now have that proprioceptive feedback of where the breath should be going and where that bracing should be focused at. You can also create it more, uh, you can create some external cues or as a game, put a yoga block on your back, put a ball on your back. And essentially now what your goal is, is to make sure that that does not fall off. So we do the same patterning. We reach an arm out in front of us, like we're Superman or Superwoman. We do the other side. We do a leg, we do a leg, we do an arm and a leg together and we do an arm and a leg together. Now, the most important thing to con- to, to focus on is making a long line. So we like to encourage making a fist as that arm reaches out in front of you. What the fist does, it creates a little bit more tension. Just by squeezing your hand, you should feel more tension into your shoulder and sometimes down into your core. And then what we do is we point the bottom of our heel. So if you make a really, really long line from the tip of your fist to the bottom of your opposite heel, long line, you're going to feel so much more tension being generated. And again, context, we're intentionally making tension. We're intentionally helping you generate tension so that your back does not feel vulnerable. The more tension that you can consciously make helps you get out of that kind of subconscious guarding spasm mode that so much of us have, especially after lower back pain. That is the whole intention. As you progress and get further along, there is detriment to 
adding overtension where you're being too tight for basic movements, like as you start to feel better, you don't need to fully brace and hold your breath picking up a set of keys, but you should be able to if you're going for like a one rep deadlift. Make sense? So now what we're going to do is going to be the, it's going to be the side plank. Now the side plank is a little different because in the, in the past, what we've done with the dead bug and the bird dog is we're moving, we're moving an appendage, an arm or a leg about a, you know, a fixed torso, a quote unquote fixed torso. We're trying to focus the intention on bracing the torso and then we move an arm or we move a leg around or about that. Now in the side plank, what we're doing is we're actually going to be pivoting the torso so around technically the hip and the knee. So if you were to be on, if you were to be in a standard plank, but this is going to be a forearm plank with instead of your arm, your forearms kind of railroad in parallel with each other, they're either at a 45 degree or they're actually, um, well, they still would be railroad together, but they're just pointing sideways instead of going front to back. So if you're watching the video, instead of like this, we're here, right? So your arms are going and pointing across from each other. What this allows you to do is be in the right position to, to pivot. It just makes it a little bit easier on your shoulder. Now, when we do this side plank, oftentimes the side plank is taught where your feet are stacked on top of each other. In this case, what your toes and your feet are essentially going to do, you're just tipping to the side. So for instance, if I'm on my toes doing my side plank and I roll to the left to do a left side plank, the outside of my left foot is on the ground and the inside of my right foot is on the ground with my, with, with kind of in a heel toe position. So the right heel is on top, is, is right in front of the left toe. You can see that we just pivot. We just fold to the side or we just fall to the side. They stay in line. They're not stacked. And then when you come back, they're in, they're, they're just in parallel together, toes on the ground. And then when you go the other way, the, it's heel toe, heel toe with the outside of the right foot down and the inside of the left foot down. Now, the reason why this is important is it, it makes it easier for you to pivot. This is a rolling side plank. The whole point is for us to be able to roll back and forth. You're just flipping yourself back and forth. Now, uh, a little bit more challenging on the shoulder. So depending on where your strength levels are with that, you do have to consider that. But the most important part here, and this is a good test and evaluation, is what does the hip... What do, sorry, what does the pelvis and the ribs relationship, um, how does it express itself when you're doing this movement? Commonly, what you'll see in order to change your center of mass, in order for you to complete the task, most people will keep both forearms on the ground. They will then rotate and pivot their pelvis first, and then the rest of the body will follow. Now, what happens is if, again, we're taking that concept of kind of tying the ribs and the pelvis together through this bracing principle, if the ribs stay in one plane of motion, so you're, you're, technically your sternum is facing the ground, so think sternum and pubic bone tied together or pointing at least in the same direction if they had laser pointers. So your sternum is still pointing to the ground, but yet your pubic bone or your pelvis is now rotated at a 90 degree angle. What's in the middle? In the middle is your lower back. And what you've now created is a torque or torsion moment around the lower back. And for a lower back that's a little sensitive or, or painful, that oftentimes does not feel good. Now, we're not doing these movements to aggravate the low back. We're doing this movement to help the low back. And by doing so, we want to try to keep that system tied together. So this is the way we coach it, and this is the way we encourage you to do it. What you're going to do is you're going to be on your forearms, whether at a 45-degree, kind of like a triangle, uh, knuckles are facing each other or arms completely going in different directions across your body. You're going to have your toes on the ground. You're going to lift one arm off the ground. You're going to feel your body shift and rotate a little bit. That's because you've taken off a point of contact. You've gone from four points of contact to three points of contact. You've taken the leg off the tripod, so to say, and your body and your core has to compensate. First and foremost, that's a great exercise right then and there. You're teaching your body how to adapt and contract and change how it uh, moves and articulates in order for you to stay in a fixed position benefit right there. Now what you're going to do is you have to log roll as a unit. So once that point of contact is taken off, you don't, you no longer need to shift your hips in order for you to start the movement. Now you simply pancake roll yourself over. 
So once you're in a side plank position, as we described earlier, you're going to hold for a couple seconds. You're going to breathe, make sure you're in a good stacked position, the shoulder's not off, so on and so forth. And then you're going to repeat the process. It should be no different. You should not rotate your pelvis first and then have your ribs come second or vice versa. The whole point of taking out the point of contact and rolling at the beginning together is so that you also finish and roll together at the end right? This is a, this is a highly valid, valuable position, a lot more challenging, which depending on the progression of where your pain is, we might not necessarily start with, but it's one that is good to reach up to because it teaches you a lot. It teaches you how to keep that tension and move about it. Cause again, it's a lot easier for you to just lay in a fixed position or in a bird dog position and move your arms around it. But now when you actually have to take your torso and move it around your shoulder or your hips, the context and the in, in the conversation changes a little bit. So great stepping stone. So this is a good starting point. It's an important starting point. It's, it's a little bit different than it, again, it falls along with the McGill Big Three, which you may not may have heard about, but you don't need a lot of different core exercises to achieve what you need to do. You need to do the core exercises that work the best and do them well. More times than not, this is all we give to start off with because most people can't handle more or B, they start getting confused and they just start doing whatever and it gets a little sloppy. Now, to emphasize and preface, this is to, to create the context, right? This is a momentary step in time through the progression of what lower back pain recovery rehab might be like. You cannot assume that this is what it'll always be like. Now, the bracing principles and the breathing principles have carry over to other movements down the road. Don't get me wrong about that. But we cannot simply say that we need to be bracing and protective and doing all these things further down the road when the pain's actually doing better. We need to do this to get things back online, create context around bracing, make the low back feel less vulnerable, so on and so forth. And then we expand upon that. You're going to be doing a lot of great core exercises like full body movements such as deadlifts, goblet squats, so on and so forth. So that's the progressive loading that we talked about. And then obviously even more challenging core exercises where you might be taking that same principle of doing like a three point, uh, like a three point row where you've now added weight to that, uh, instead of having four points of contact, three points of contact in your obliques and your core are really, really working in order for you to maintain that good position. But what commonly happens and where people get in trouble is they think now that we're not in pain, that core exercise can get sloppy. And that's where we commonly then run into potential issues down the road. So again, context is, context is everything. Making sure that what you're doing um, is valuable for the for the training phase or the stage of life that you're in, uh, making sure that we're being a little bit more conscious and intentional about the movements that we're doing and that we have the actual know-how and awareness um, to be able to do a lot of those core exercises. But again, like we want to be able to help you out. So take it for what it is. This is in no way saying that these exercises are right for you because I have no idea who you are and what your pain is, so on and so forth. But for a lot of people, it, they help a lot. If you're being managed by someone and they're just giving you crap exercises, you know, maybe bring these up, provide some resources, this episode, I don't know. Um, obviously, you can reach out. You know, We have remote clients that we try to help out wherever we can because unfortunately, the uh, the burden of low back pain is so great. And oftentimes the care that's associated and provided for that is, is subpar. And I'm not saying that we are in fact the best choice in the world, but we've been doing this for a while and we've been helping a lot of people out. And I just want you guys to be, to be feeling better and to get back to the things you do. Like that's why we are trying to provide this for you. Cause we want to be able to be that guide for you to the adventurous life you're made for. We don't want to see you guys hung up because of this nagging, pain and you know you getting the same poor core quote unquote core exercises so if you got low back pain uh, have the conversation with the provider have the conversation with your rehab practitioner your physical therapist your chiropractor your coach so on and so forth uh, I really hope this was helpful guys this is uh, been something that has helped me out in the past and obviously a number of different individuals but again the devil is in the details with a lot of this earlier stuff. We can get a little bit, we have a little bit more freedom when things aren't as sensitized uh, and painful. So keep that in mind, but this will help you. This this can help you. So um, I really appreciate you guys tuning in. If uh, the, the biggest thing that I ask you for is 
is leave us a review. If this is helping you, please leave us a review so that we know and we can hear those stories. Um, if you have other questions about certain things, we want to be able to help and provide more specific content for you, the listener. And more importantly, share this. Like this is low back pain is one of the top disabilities in the world. I guarantee if you just think for two seconds, you will come across a name that is dealing with low back pain. Someone you know directly, someone you know indirectly, more likely than not someone that is within your immediate circle, family, friends, so on and so forth, Jim, whatever that is. Share this with them. I know it'll help them. And if anything, at least stems and starts a conversation about other avenues that they may or may not have tried yet. So, you know, it never hurts. Uh, thanks for tuning in, guys. Um, keep living that. Keep living that loud life. Keep doing whatever you guys are doing. Seek the adventure and uh, we'll see you next time. Live loud.